I'm going to talk about the art and a very, very little bit of the science behind how we engage people, and in particular, the people who depend on and, and impact nature. Um, and I'm going to give you a few examples of how the Natural Capital Project's been doing it in ways that are both imaginative and fun and creative. So um, I hope to inspire you to get involved and um, try some of these things out. I'd like to begin first with a confession, use this as a bit of a confessional, that I have been involved with many projects that have failed. They have failed to have impact. Um, and I hasten to add that most of these projects were before I joined Natural Capital Project in WWF, obviously. Um, when I was young and, and foolish in previous roles, um, acting as an environmental economist in um, government agencies. And what I would tend to do is hire some very good consultants who I respect their work. I would hire them, I would ask them to do a report on the value of ecosystem services. And there would be very limited engagement with people. So these consultants would fly in and out, maybe do a choice experiment, maybe do a survey. They'd write up a really nice, neat report about each ecosystem service and the value of them, and they'd put it all in some sort of total economic value framework, and they'd hand back that report. And needless to say, those reports gathered a lot of dust and had very little impact. And, and one of my favorites, and, um, and I dearly love the people who worked on this if they get to hear this, <laughs> was in Montserrat, um, which is an extremely curious place in the Caribbean, a very small island that in um, 1995 had a, um, a previously dormant volcano uh, erupt. So two-thirds of the population had to flee Montserrat, and about 1,000 people stuck around. And I tell you, those people are fierce <laughs> and fearless because they stayed even when lava was running down the hillside towards them. So, but it meant that we didn't really have even that many people to engage, but still, we didn't do it. Um, so we built a lot of these reports. They had great titles. This one was called Value After the Volcano, but they didn't really have a lot of impact. And if you look at the broader picture um, of ecosystem service studies globally, um, there's also a kind of worrying picture. So this is some work done by Jan Laurence in, uh, in Paris uh, with colleagues back in 2013. They took um, about 450 ecosystem service valuation studies, and they looked at whether they were, had documented a real use case of use in decision making, or even had some analysis of use, or had cursory or no reference whatsoever. So actual use cases was 3%. Some exploration or analysis of use was 6%, and the rest, the other 90%, barely mentioned it at all. So there's obviously a large part of the community that is doing this without exploring use in decision making. And this is obviously dated to 2013, and this report actually then kicked us <laughs> to um, really write up and explore some of this in earnest in the subsequent years. So based on you know, my own personal failures and um, <laughs> And the subsequent, you know, I would say some successes, some really, I believe, successes we've had at NatCap, I've come to the belief that our work, this community's work on natural capital, will only have impact if we engage with people. Um, if we do not engage with people, we're going to have no impact. And that is a challenge to all of us. So we need to learn the skills and the strategy for doing this. And it's more important and it's more difficult in my view, than the science and the data itself. So we need to come down from our ivory towers or our NGO offices or whatever walls you like to live within and get over the fact that we have few incentives and we have few of the skills and few of the tools and too little time to do this um, because if we don't do it, we're not going to achieve what we're all setting out to do. And this shared sort of two-way communication is really important. Now this slide I'm going to whiz through. I was once told by a mentor of mine that when giving a talk you should have one really wonky framework slide that shows you've thought about this deeply. So this is the slide. <laughs> we've thought about it deeply. We've studied a lot of places. Great, you can take some pictures and study it later. Uh, this, is from a, this is from a paper we did where we looked at three NatCap case studies on spatial planning. And we looked at the different ways in which knowledge was used. Now the one takeaway I want you to take from this is that in all three of those cases, we found that this way of using knowledge, which is called conceptual use, 
was foundational. It was not the only way it was used. And this is about understanding and beliefs and values. People had to use knowledge in that way before they could then use it more instrumentally, you know, to change a policy or change a plan or more strategically to maneuver their way through the political and power dynamics. But that underpinning of conceptual use was the first thing in all three cases. And so for me, the takeaway is that and we also found that to get that kind of use, you need to have regular, meaningful participation with stakeholders, engaging diverse groups regularly. Um, and so we understand the importance of all of this. So now I get to the fun part, the creative part. And I'm not saying these are all the answers. Um, there are going to be many, many other ways we have to engage people. And, and especially if we're working with different groups, private sectors, different power dynamics, we've got to be very thoughtful about this. But I want to give three um, examples where I think the Natural Capital Project in the last 10 years has done this really well and has also had a lot of fun doing it. So the first is playing games. The second is being creative with communication. And the third is, is listening actively and, and, and earnestly <clears throat> to others. So starting on games, and Henry, who you've all got to um, know and love because he organizes the symposium, and Greg, I don't know if Greg Verutas is in the room, could give a hand wave. He's not here, okay. Oh yes, there he is. <laughs> Was behind a lot of this work. Um, that we've developed what we like to call, some people have liked to call serious games, although you can see from the quantity of beer and wine on this table that we also have lots of fun doing it. Um, and these games are really about examining the impact of alternative development paths. Um, we tend to play them with different groups. Um, and one amazing moment we had with a, a partner in a financial institution that's pretty mainstream and hasn't, hadn't at the time thought about the environment much. We'd been talking to them for about a year and it wasn't really clicking. And then they came to this event at the symposium and they played one of these versions of these games and then they said, ah, I get it, I get it, I get what you're trying to do. So it's a really nice way of people having those aha moments. Um, so there's a, a whole series of these games that um, Henry and Greg can tell you more about. Um, there's one, the first one we did was based in the Belize example that you've heard about. Um, there's the agriculture one based on terrestrial and freshwater services. There's the Ar an Arctic one, um, which I've worked with a lot looking at Arctic development and um, one which is more around linear infrastructure. And all of them are, are available for people to use and to, to print out. And what they tend to, what we, we find that they're useful for doing is conveying the concepts of how people, um, how nature contributes to people, bringing home the difficult decisions that need to be made between development and conservation, what you lose and what you gain, um, and demonstrating how spatial information can be particularly powerful um, for locating where um, development takes place. So they've been really powerful and fun tools. So the second example is around creative communication. So this is a group that is playing the game, but can anyone do spot the difference and see what's different in this picture? No beer, oh yeah, there's no beer and wine. Also, we haven't done an online version. Those two guys on the phone are not playing an online version. Any, else, any other guesses? Yes, easels, great. So there is art in the background. So, um, and I'd like to credit a colleague of ours, Jill Schwartz, um, who's at WWF, who in our communications team, who has really pushed us and inspired us to be more creative with our communication. So this is a, um, a forum for sustainable infrastructure that Kate Newman organized, also I'm sure in this room, um, where we played the linear infrastructure game. And as well um, as her playing the game, they had this art in the background to get people thinking. And in Myanmar, WWF commissioned a young local photographer to um, take picture of pictures of how people were interacting with nature in the countryside, and then hosted this gallery um, art show, uh, both in Yangon and in Darwe, showing people interacting with nature. So they framed the photos, and they laid them out side by side with the natural capital maps. And um, according to Hannah Helsingen, who works at WF Myanmar, people are still coming two years later and saying how much impact this had on them, how much they took away from this, how much they understood about not only the people they were seeing in the photos, but their own interactions with nature. So um, many people came, more drinks, <laughs> it's a bit of a theme, um, and yeah, some really, some really powerful moments. So as well as working on art, we um, also developed this interactive website. You can go and play, have a play around on this. It's um, uh, myanmarnaturalcapital.org. 
So um, we visually enhanced the natural capital maps and posted them online so the underlying data is much more accessible. So it's really beautiful, it's really interactive, um, and it makes the concepts much easier for a layperson to understand than many of the maps that we've been looking at for the last two days, which, you know, for this community, nice, you know, you can interpret them. For the average person, mean absolutely nothing. Um, this is the video we also, you, uh, those of you who were here at the lunch break got a chance to see um, this video that we did about nat uh, natural capital in Mozambique, um, also using videos uh, as a creative forum. So finally, our final tactic here is active listening, and I've put this last, but I think it's probably the most important. And this is, um, obviously we're engaging with people in that gameplay and in those, those creative communications, but this is really down at the project level. So where the Natural Capital Project team are working in places um, with conversations. And, and Anne Gary spoke yesterday about, about this importance of listening, patience, I would add, emotional intelligence, different ways of knowing, reflecting back that you've heard um, people. And this is something that I would say many people in the NatCap team are, are really good at. It's a, um, an absolute joy to be with people who are so good at this. So I wanted to give a brief example from the Bahamas work, which um, uh, Catherine Wyatt and um, Katie Alkema have led, where they developed a development plan in Andros Island with the Office of the Prime Minister and um, Inter-American Development Bank. And, and in that, I think it really epitomizes how um, the work was done, chatting with people, asking them simple questions. What do you want? What matters to you? Then coming back with you know, things from education to health to transport to food security to water security, coming back with things that really matter. And then the, the NACAP team translating that back to how ecosystems and ecosystem services support all of that and how we can explore those trade-offs. So um, there's some really lovely examples. One of the quotes in a, um, uh, that Katie shared with me was a profitable land crab that put our children through college. I love this concept. Um, and then uh, there's a thing called the uh, bonefish, which um, brings $50 million annually to Andros Island, and this recognition of the importance of these fisheries for their communities. So you're probably quite familiar with these kinds of um, maps now, but using that kind of conversation to have um, insights and influence into what matters to people so that ultimately the kind of science we're doing does have impact. So, um, in conclusion, I would like to encourage all of you to um, come out of our ivory towers and get onto the street or the beach or the lagoon or the forest or the river, whatever, or maybe the, into the finance, uh, uh, finance institution's office, but get into the streets so that we're talking with people and um, encourage you all that uh, we have lots of tools, lots of experience that um, are impactful and also incredibly fun. Thank you. Um, this is really important work, and I love the creativity that went into this. One of the things I'm curious about is how organizations learn from their mistakes. And I talked about this in a previous session, so I apologize. But we're pretty good at doing an evaluation and figuring out what did work and what didn't work. What we're not so good at is creating organizations that actually know how to learn so that these lessons are learned and implemented. It sounds like you figured this out, and I'm just curious what you do within NatCap and WWF to make you capable of actually changing your, your plans based on knowledge that you've gotten from the field. Wow. <laughs> Looking at Rebecca, who's our chief scientist. <laughs> um, I'm sure there are many better answers than the one I'm about to give off the top of my head. But what I've found, um, I would say what we've done in Akabanachi, it's emerged almost, this meeting's emerged from it, is a culture of reflection. So um, we have something called our Olympics. <laughs> so called because we run many different events <laughs> that are quite tiring. Um, it's like a inter, for people who are involved with the Natural Capital Project Partnership, we come together once a year, um, a bit like with the symposium, a smaller group, and we reflect on what we're learning and what's going well and what's not, and we share. And I, I mean, I think that would be my instinct, is um, it's pretty informal, um, but having a safe, safe space where you can be open and where people, again, are good at listening and sharing across disciplines is very powerful.
Hi, Emily. Um, this culture of active listening, I also really appreciate. And I'm wondering if you can give a good example of a case where this kind of active listening led to a, a real um, sea change in the kind of work that was ended up being done. Because I can think of a lot of examples where we listen to people and we integrate what they say into the way that we were kind of planning to do things anyway. <laughs> so, I mean, that's not being entirely fair, but you know, like, is there an example where it really shifted fundamentally the way that you approached a problem? The way I approached a problem, or, or where they, the way they did, or oh, either. Me either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm looking at Spencer at <laughs> the back. <laughs> um, Spencer and I have been working with an institution that um, doesn't typically w work on environmental issues and um, learning about how they make decisions um, uh, in, the, in the finance sector, how, what their constraints are, what they, um, the way they operationalize things internally to really, like we spent many hours and many meetings really understanding their incentives and their structures and their processes and through that, thought about how we could adapt the way we work, the way we do use um, and produce uh, natural capital information to meet their needs. So that, that's one specific example. I mean, I think you need to get yourself into the headspace. And it could, you know, those examples I gave were communities, but it could just as well be a, a business or a financial institution or, or a government. But understanding um, their positions, their opportunities, their constraints, and then being imaginative and um, patient <laughs> and all the many things that Spencer is <laughs> the back there. He's hating being put on the spot. Um, to think about how we would have to adjust the science we do and the way we work to meet their needs. You can get me later, Spencer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>